The authors have worked together to make several reconstructions of a nettle and hidework textile panel and a cattle hair and tin stud woven band from the Bronze Age site of Whitehorse Hill, Dartmoor, UK. This collaboration has now spanned seven years and work is still ongoing. Reconstruction as research deals with unfamiliar materials and methods. In addition, the starting resources are themselves a challenge to find in the right condition. We currently have a call out for a suitable fresh bearskin on two continents. And of course, this needs to be able to be used to discuss ethical issues and sustainability. Often these kinds of unique finds require a period of experimentation before attempting a specific reconstruction. This is especially the case where the artefacts are made from composite materials. Cattle hair, tin studs, calfskin and nettles combine several elements of unfamiliar. The paper draws out two neglected themes, why practical knowledge and experimentation should be valued as part of academic research and why research on public presentation is just as necessary as research on artefact technologies. The missing majority research agenda has been the focus of my research for a long time. In particular, a combination of approaches, including experimental work, sensory engagement and digital technologies, have been used to address the whole object biography from the original plant or animal all the way through to the museum communication of objects. Why? The problem of presenting perishable material culture is evident here. The ancient objects are now darkened and fragmentary. The finds need to be kept in low light. To those who know these things, they are an exciting and unique set of finds. But to the ordinary visitor, they are a black blob. They may walk past the object unless they look closely. Reconstructions are research to investigate the original object, but also its presentation. The discovery of a Bronze Age granite cyst or grave in 2011 in a peat bog on Whitehorse Hill revealed the first organic remains found on the moor and a hoard of about 150 beads. The National Park's archaeologists found an intact cremation deposit, human bones, buried with a number of grave goods. Hair objects from this period exist, but are incredibly rare, and I don't know of any that have tin studs worked into the weave structure. When you look at the original woven bracelet or armband, you can see the delicacy of the paired individual hairs. These were plaited together to make a band only four millimetres wide, and yet so intricate. This slide lists the different reconstructions made for a BBC film, a three-month exhibition in Plymouth in 2014, and for the new galleries in Plymouth at The Box, opened in September 2020. Each time the artefacts are reconstructed, something more is learnt and there are new aspects to look for in the archaeological find. Reconstructions can also be part of TV productions, educational outreach and temporary or permanent exhibitions. There are different challenges and opportunities with each. These aspects form yet another part of the experiment as the crafters and curators study public comments and opinions on the display materials. Before going into details, I wanted to explain something about the temporary exhibition. Traditional crafted replicas copy the material and technology. They give a sense of materiality and use and are authentic to in-life qualities. 3D prints also replicate but they copy the artefact in its current ancient state. Both are authentic, but in different ways. The 3D prints can also help with the crafted replicas, as time with the real objects is often limited. The major exhibition at the Plymouth City Museum and Art Gallery in autumn 2014 displayed many of the replicas crafted for the film and some commissioned later. The crafted replicas were a feature of the exhibition and commented on by the visitors. There was also a first use of a 3D print installed as a touchable element within an exhibition. The touchable installation was immediately beside the case, showing the original basket and crafted replica. The light box illuminates the translucent 3D print of the complete basket. The transparent movable tiles are also on the light table. The thread attaching one of the tiles to the plinth is just visible on the right. Fiona Pitt, curator, Plymouth, Sherry Doyle, conservatory and basketry expert, and Alison Sheridan, Bronze Age expert, National Museum of Scotland, 
and Linda Herkham were all using the 3D print to discuss a fine detail of the basket technology. The prints were not only used by visitors, but research experts as well. The relationship between the object in the case and the touchable 3D print was clear and immediate. Visitor reaction showed the enrichment of the extrasensory experience, including young visitors. Moving on to the crafted replica of the bracelet or armband, for the BBC programme, Jamie Inglis provided the studs and I made the woven band from horsehair. In the original piece of jewellery, the metal studs had deteriorated, but the process of replication brought the beauty of this object back to life. The bracelet can now be seen to work at two levels. Up close, you can see intricacy of the braiding, but even from a distance, you can see the shine of the tiny metal studs. It's a delicate version of a punk studded cuff. It is assumed that the bracelet belonged to a special person because by the standards of the age, the buried items are prestigious. When Jamie Inglis and I looked at our first crafted bracelet beside the archaeological object, we both felt that the original object was smaller, neater and far more skilled than ours, and we both agreed that we would do our best to replicate it in the next version. Here, the studs and hair used in the first and second version of the bracelet are directly compared. The second version of the woven band was made from cattle hair, as by that time this information was known. It was put into the exhibition on a bracelet style mount but had an unfinished end. The curator Fiona liked it because it showed just how springy the original was and brought out more of the challenges of the materials. Most people have never tried to weave cattle hair. The third version was made for the permanent exhibition. In particular, the tightness of the weave was improved by using weights on the hair as the braiding progressed. The finished third version showed how the material behaves with the natural twist within the whole band and the wiriness of individual hairs both evident. Moving on to the textile panel, the fibres were identified as nettle, urtica dioica, but which method was used to extract thin strands to weave them? The essential problems are stripping the leaves dry or wet and then removing the outer epidermis and the inner pith to release the fibres. There are many ways to do this. Retting, a gentle and very controlled rot, was a key part of that process and this slide shows how the retting was achieved and the release of the fibres. Though retting is well known for flax, it is difficult to get the timing right and retting nettle is more delicate still. Over many years I have been having discussions with Dr Ulle Mannering, Ida de Mont and Anna Batzer, researchers and expert textile specialists. There are very few drop spindles from the archaeological record for this period and region, so spinning was undertaken with a wooden drop spindle. The single Z-twist threads were very fine and these were then plied to make the finished thread. The nettle textile had two different size threads that had to be replicated, as shown here. Loom weights are rare finds from the period and region, so the textile was woven on a backstrap loom, as shown here. The other element of the textile panel was the calfskin bands known as beading that edged the nettle woven element. Here again, the process of replication started with the raw skins chosen according to the features of the original objects, defleshing and dehairing were the first steps. Sections of calfskin were treated in different ways to show different possibilities, including fat tan using brain and bark tan using different tree species. Obtaining the bark and making up the tanning solution involved still more choices and steps in the process. In all this, staying true to the original was important and as part of this, samples were checked against a 3D print of the original. In the first textile panel, two different versions of the hide work were shown on either side. Sinew from the backstrap region of a red deer was used as the sewing thread material. The whole was assembled, recreating the original as faithfully as possible. Hello, my name is Professor Linda Herkham, and I just want to use this short clip to show you some of the sensory qualities of the replicas of the Bronze Age textile. It's made from nettle fibres as the woven element and calfskin as the, the hide work element. The first thing to do was to weave 
up the nettle fibres but actually it was really tricky to get them to this kind of level of spun fibre and here although this is quite a fine thread if I untwist it slightly you can see that it's actually two threads plied together so the weaving was incredibly fine and because we were using this for research as well as education and outreach we also tagged batches and took samples of everything and made lots of records. The nettles were woven up in this first example using the finer system as the weft threads and these as the warp threads and in the other example the fine system is the warp threads instead. So we've reversed the system on the two samples. These were made as part of touchable elements for the museum so that members of the public and educational groups could actually feel some nettle textile fibre. And just to show you, it's tough, it's got a reasonable drape and flex and it's got these lovely sort of oatmeal colours to it. This one, which was made to go into the replica panel as a whole, is again really tough, flexible. It's not scratchy, but it's not perfectly soft and fluffy either. All of these items started off life in a field or in a woodland as nettles, and we've also, as part of the research, taken the calf skins from a raw skin all the way through to finished leather. These items go folded up and then are sewn onto the edges and then they're finished off by a little detail with these fine triangles. All of this work is quite a challenge to reproduce because you're taking things from the raw materials in the environment all the way through to replication of the object from the Bronze Age, which was itself, I think, a very exquisite object. This is just an example to explain something about the textile and its qualities and the idea of reconstruction as research. When I said that re reconstruction was an act of research, I wanted to document why that was the case. In all the hide and nettle processing, weaving and making up, there are multiple possibilities. Using mathematical ways of representing these choices, there is an astonishing 72,576 potential variations. The selection of the methods used relied on, firstly, detailed archaeological knowledge of the relevant finds, and also for the crafts, both connaissance, conceptual knowledge, savoir-faire, practical know-how and skill, and all these across several craft spheres. Reconstruction is an act of research and expertise. The finished reconstructions are now on display alongside the original archaeological finds in the permanent exhibition at the Box, Plymouth. The reconstructions are research on the finds themselves and the craft processes by which they could be made, and also on their public presentation. Thank you.